the way on the left of your screen, right of your screen. One of the two is on my left. It's probably on the right of your screen. Giants on the blue side, Wind and Rain on the red. And we have a Jace, Rakan, Thresh, and Lee Sin ban already. I just need to slowly move myself over so I don't look like I'm huddling up to Jack. Just, uh, <laughs> it's just all, it's all just like shoulder touch. This is, uh, this is how it's me and... It's warm enough already in this room. It's, it's way too warm. I like the way you're like just miles away. Like, <laughs> anyway, Please. yes, let's, let's go through these picks and bans. So we've got... Uh, Jace, Rakan, and LeBlanc being banned out from the side of Giants, who do not have any subs today. Wind and Rain oh, have a sub bot lane, Zach. and Zack is open. Yeah, Zack has been left open, Giants. They make no mistakes here. They lock that in straight away. And again, another Zack makes it through the pick and ban phase. Has been 100% yeah. across this Challenger series to replicate every other major region in their professional leagues. 100% pick ban. Zack has been on 7-11. Yeah, not really a surprise there. What's a Wind and Rain like? Pick, what do you pick to, to work into this? They, Wind and Rain do have a couple of subs. Just quickly run through that. Dark Side and Quickset played for them in CSQ. They will be with Origin from next week. And Kakan was their substitute mid laner in CSQ. Larson will be replacing him from next week. Yeah, that's there's two pretty big substitutions. Let's let's be honest with ourselves. Well, th sorry, three big substitutions for Wind and Rain. So, performing only with a couple of members of their full roster here. So you can imagine, uh, they don't want to, they haven't really got many pocket picks to kind of choose from, as it were. So Zai is going to be the lock away, as well as actually Kazakh's first time of the day is going to be the lock in here for Dan. Now Giants, they've got a big thing to answer to here. Obviously being banned away, the Rakan being banned away here, do they just go for an AD? They do, they actually pick up the Kalim. I really like the Zaya into the Zac, by the way. It just means that you have the ability to negate the engage from Zac's elastic slingshot. You also have the ability to dodge his ultimate where necessary as well. It is always that get out of jail free card that you need if you ever get put into dire straits and you are locked down by a Zac, so you always have that ultimate to prevent you from being sort of isolated and drawn back into the enemy team. It's going to be, like you said, the Caitlyn and now also going to lock in the brawl. I've got a very strong bot lane there. The shove is okay. You know, Caitlyn is always going to have okay shove with the Piltover Peacemaker. I'll have to see how Wind and Rain choose to respond. Oh, they're going to respond with the Cassidy for Kakan in that middle lane. Uh, we didn't actually see him play at all in the CSQ. He is a strong player, I believe he's from the LVP. Uh, he is a strong player, but he hasn't had the opportunity to prove himself. Absolutely not. Hasn't yet had the chance, especially on the Wind and Rain roster. Like he said, he was a substitute for the majority of that week. Has his chance to shine now before Larson comes in and steps up to the plate the following week. Remember, this is a substitute situation, a little bit like Origin. They had to have three members of the qualifying um, wind, and yeah. wind and Rain roster, so you had to have at least three members that were put down for the Challenger Series qualification. And uh, Kakan, Darkseid, and Quickseth were all on that roster for Wind and Rain when they qualified, so they have to play this first week of the Challenger Series. That they do. I mean, one kind of thing looking at the the kind of pick and ban phase right now, Wind and Rain don't really have any much set up in the lanes apart from obviously Zaya, but she has to go fairly aggressive in order to try and get a route for that Kazakh to actually make an impact in the yeah. early stage of the game. Cassidy, no CC apart from a stun and an interrupt as well. So there's not really much set up there. So you can imagine he's going to go for more farming, but when the other bands do come through rather sharpish, we'd have a Lucian and a Fiora ban away for Wind and Rain and a Kennen and Karma for Giants. I always like Braum into Zaya, by the way, because it can prevent those roots quite handily. You block those feathers. So uh, I, I've always liked that as a potential pickup here. And uh, Wind and Rain are going to start rounding things out. Yeah, so you're looking for support in top lane. Shen as the top lane makes a bit of sense. I'm surprised they've left their support for last pick. It's not yeah. something we commonly see, especially since you want some CC from it. Like, I wonder if we'll see something like a Zyra, although you need a bit of tankiness as well. So it's a bit of a balancing act. Like, they're, they're not going to win the lane into Caitlyn Braum unless they take a mage. Uh, and otherwise, you're looking at something like a Tarm Kench just to protect the Zyra even more, but then you need to win on the rest of the map. I don't mind the Tarm Kench, you know. Yeah. I think Tarm Kench could be a, a perfectly viable pick in this situation. Not only will you potentially be able to protect Kastin in certain situations, but you obviously also have that double protect for the Zyra. You've got to be very careful about the way that you play Tarm Kench into a Zac, however, because of that ultimate. If you you eat a little bit too early, use that Devour a little bit too early, you could just be dragging yourself and your AD carry to death. Yeah, that's that's the big problem there. And uh, do you know what's even worse than kind of drag dragging your AD carry to death is actually getting trapped in a cataclysm with them in your mouth. So kind of holding that one away from the Jarvan. If Gilius can kind of time that right, you know you can get a two for the price of one and uh, pick up both the support Ooh, and AD. Ooh, Alistair, whoa, that, whoa, I like whoa. that. I okay. really like that. that so Alistair's going to be the lock in here. So that is a Zaya Alistair lane 
versus a Caitlyn Braum. Braum, Caitlyn, extremely, can play extremely aggressively. Can just like walk up to this Alistair, walk up to the Zaya, get some procs down, just walk off again and go, okay, so now Caitlyn auto attack a couple of times and we get a stun, beautiful trade. But with Alistair coming into the mix and a Kha'Zix, it could spell disaster for the Giants bot lane if played correctly. I actually don't know if this is much towards the laning phase and more towards when you get to team fight situations. Alistair might actually say, do you know what, Zach? Pick me up. Drag me towards your team. <laughs> and suddenly I can get a massive pulverized look for that kind yeah. of play because you can get straight into the enemy team and be a nuisance that way. I don't think that's necessarily the case. This will allow the Zaya and the Alistair to set up for roams, to set up for tower dives. I mean, you have got an excellent tower dive composition here coming from Wind and Rain. As Alistair goes in, you have the Shen, you have the, um, the Kha'Zix and the Kastin, all of which are going to dive in on that situation and look to make plays around early turrets. That could be what we see here. Post six, we might see some big plays in the bot lane. One thing I wanted to point out uh, a couple of games ago, actually, was the fact that LeBlanc and a Shen, and it kind of works the same way with a Kassadin and a Shen. You can r be really sneaky with the Stan United, not using defensively, aggressively. Yeah. You channel Stan United when uh, the Kassadin slash LeBlanc Kassadin in this matchup is out of vision pop over the wall with the Rift Walk, instant Shen on top of the back line. It could be extremely devastating, and that's exactly where they're going to want to go. They're going to want to be able to take out and isolate that Caitlyn ASAP to take her out of the game completely, and then just follow up on the rest of the team. Rather than letting Gilius actually getting a nice Cataclysm off, just make the proactive play, use that Fog of War to your, your advantage, and just uh, get on the back line. It's a very unique interaction, but it, it can still work and be effective. I always really like Kastin into Caitlyn, by the way, just because it's one of the few champions in the mid lane that could consistently pressure her in the back line whilst negating that advantage that Caitlyn has. Caitlyn is innately, you know, sort of coined as a good late game carry simply because her single target damage with headshot is very, very strong when you have the items and the range advantage that she has. She has the, the naturally highest range at level one without having augmentation from skills. So Kastin is the, one of the only champions in the game that can effectively essentially blink past the majority of the enemy protection straight into that backline to deal with Caitlyn, especially if you go the build that we saw last game, which was that Lich Bane build. Very, very powerful single target damage. Yeah, popularized by um, Apto over in Korea. It's got a, like, it was a ridiculous 81% win rate or something near high master challenger level. Split pushing all game basically, takes the teleport and uh, just sits in that mid lane, then rotates down to one of the side lanes, just pushes with it using that Lich Bane, drawing aggro, and then the rest of their team can make plays across the map. And I think that's honestly what's going to happen here because Oriana, not the greatest of split pushes, not against someone like a Kassadin either. Yeah, you've got a good 1v1 from War, haven't you, with the Shen and with the Kassadin? Exactly. Let's, let's just take a step back and look at the organizations as well because we just saw Origin 2 0 with subs come down from the LCS in CS, got a new roster, we're able to 2-0 up against a, a strong Challenger Series team. Giants will be looking to do the same, and a lot of people have looked at their roster and said, it's not the strongest. Like, I recognize a few of the names here and there, but I don't look at them and say, yeah, they're a, they're a, you know, a Red Bull beater, they're a Schalke beater. They're the sort of a team that we expect to be challenging for playoffs, but not in that first or second spot. I think we'll have to see how this, this tones out. I think Julius. That is such a weak answer. Okay, okay. <laughs> that is, come on, give I, me something here. Oh, we'll see how the games play. Sure, sure we will. Everyone will see how the games play. We pay you to analyze it, Scoundrel. Analyze for me. I think Julius is an incredibly good Challenger Series. <laughs> I hate you. I think Julius is an incredibly good Challenger Series jungler. I think he can have huge influence, especially when he is gifted something like a Zac. So I genuinely think there is strength to the Giants roster. I think it should beat this Wind and Rain roster. Okay, I, no, I, I think it should beat this Wind and Rain. You're roster. telling me the composition wins. You're not telling me the players win. Like I'm asking you, do you think Giants are a good enough team over a five-week split no. to challenge for a playoff spot? No. Okay, that's all you have to say, <laughs> Jules. What do you think? Um, I think they can potentially. If um, if if Gilius shows up, honestly, yes, he is like the challenger series jungler, right? Yeah. He has been around the scene for so long, and honestly, I do think if you give him power picks like a Zach, I really do think they uh, can challenge for these playoffs. Not spots. talking about composition. Do you think they are a good enough team to challenge for playoffs? He's being intentionally awkward. Yes by or the way. no? <laughs> if they're on their ball, yes. Okay. War. Let's go over to the other side. With their full roster, we'll, we'll exclude today because they've got subs in. Sure. Do you think they're a good enough team to challenge for playoffs? Who's their bot lane that should be coming? Dark side and quick. Uh, Dark side and quick side being replaced by. I haven't got it in front of me. But, uh, either you got it in front of you. I can't remember. We who pay their bot you lane to is. be the host. Of yeah, this. we do. We do. <laughs> oh, poo. I'll find it out. But yeah, talk about the rest of their lane while I, I find it out. I think. I think giants. Oh, it's are... Moonlight and AOD. 
cash. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I, think, I, from I genuinely think that is a strong team. I, I think if I were to rank, from what I've seen today, if I were to rank the teams in order. Oh, here we go. This, okay, let me uh, hit Scoundrel's tier list. Here I we go. I think it's Red Bulls and Schalke contesting for the top spot. RBS04, yeah. I yep. genuinely think Origin, with their full Wind and Rain roster, could be third. I think you're looking at PSG fourth. I think you're looking at. Maybe this Wind and Rain roster with Willite and AOD at fifth. I think that's a little bit of switch around with PSG, and I think, unfortunately, Giants, Giants right in last place. Go on, Jules, hit us up. I think you uh, go fourth place for Giants instead. And I, I would agree the So PSG about the don't same. qualify? Judging on their performance, no. Well, we are on to the Summoner's Rift for the final series of the day. I'm going to leave you in the wonderful hands of Excandrel and Jaws. Take it away. Thank you very much, Medic. And what a beautiful host you have been, Yeah, that's Giants. a joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, not so much kind of leaving us high and dry. But Giants versus Wind and Rain. And I cannot wait to get on the Rift because, yes, Wind and Rain right now have three members of their squad that are technically substitutes. And Giants, like I said, I think if Gilius, you'd given these strong picks like the Zac, can be a real playmaker. I think what's interesting about this whole Challenger series is that you're rating these teams. You know, we sort of rated them as, as sort of one six. I actually think it's incredibly close across the entire board. I think this could be one of the highest levels of Challenger series that we have yet to see in the European League of Legends scene. So I think it's going to be very close. There is room for movement there, but I definitely think Schalke and, P and uh, Red Bull or RB are right at the top there. I've been thoroughly impressed with the Origin roster, and I think it's only going to get better when they have their full team back together. This is going to be an incredible game, though. Giants and Wind and Rain. Interestingly enough, we can actually mention uh, Dark Side and Quick Stuff. Obviously, they will be jumping over to Origin for week number two. So I think for them, it's a bit of a fairy tale coming into this one. CSQ was a bit more like underestimation, but I want to see how they do do against Giants right now, if they do kind of buck under this pressure or not. And I want to see how they want to play this map, because like we mentioned before, a 3-1-3 is a very viable strategy here from War. But the problem is, especially coming into the early stages, it's going to be very, very hard for Kakan actually on this, uh, on this Kassadin to come up against Oriana. Yeah, definitely early laning phase. Jazuki should win that on the Oriana, or at least should shove the Kassadin in, should be able to put pressure on him in the early game. When this gets to the 1-3-1, -one, with that double teleport, you are going to see advantages open up for Wind and Rain because they'll have that sort of, um, I guess, benefit over the Giants roster. The Giants will be looking to engage and try and punish that. They'll be looking to use the Zac, the Oriana combo there. And you do have that disengage of the Alistair, but remember, he could become suspect. He could kind of sacrifice his life for these disengages. So when it goes to a 1-3-1, -one, you're going to have to see Kakan and Jaywell actually teleport in in almost every attempted engage from Giants, especially if they land those elastic slingshots where necessary. So this could be very scary because usually when you have a 1-3-1, you like to have a jungler that can form the disengage for you, something like a Gragas. Use that, that cast to just sort of negate the engage from the remainder of the Giants team and then sort of back off and reset everything. But they don't have that for war right now, so they're going to have to be very careful about executing this 1-3-1. Okay, so let's talk about the compositions in terms of team fights then. Because you mentioned there, there's, there's a little bit of disengage there from war. You can use the Alistair, kind of almost sacrifice himself, or, you know, headbutt one target away. Kakan, easy. Just riff walk, just not not too much of a problem. Wow, you know, he can use uh, the dash to kind of get away. Dan can obviously leap away. Darkseid um, does have the Featherstorm to kind of disengage. But the problem is I kind of see from Giant's end, they have so much engage, they can just keep engaging over and over again. One big key cooldown down for war, and that's Giant's just capitalizing well, you on think it, right? if you If you proc that ultimate from Zaya, or Quickseth is forced to use the Pulverize and ultimate to get out of the place, you know, once that's down, you still have the follow-up of Ruin looking for an engage. Elastic Slingshot's on a, a shorter cooldown than those kind of skills. You know, Giants can consistently, consistently throw themselves at this war lineup. And you'll force teleports from Kakan, you'll force ultimates from JWoww. You will make it very difficult for them to execute on a 1-3-1 this way. If Kakan can get ahead and can start to fight in side lanes and can be aggressive and get 1v1s all the time, maybe you'll see them start to find some, some joy in that particular strategy, but I agree, and I think War are going to have to be super careful. The problem is that even if they have the Cassadin joining up in a four to try and make it less likely that the engages go their way, it's still a Cassadin. You're still kind of sitting ducks waiting for Giants to make the moves. There's nothing that you can do proactively. And you could kind of, you could kind of even say Quickseth has to use that headbutt or pulverize to kind of get Gilius out of the mix. He jumps in with the elastic slingshot. And then he uses the headbutt pulverized to kind of get Gilius out of the fray. And then 
back off and then play the team fight out from there. Just negate his engagement and, and negate that uh, let's bounce and then roll out. Because realistically, if Gilius does find something, which he might want to find something now, nice pulverize there on Gilius. Uh, just getting with the way Jack roll as well. Elastic slingshot is not going to find its mark. Just taking a little bit of damage, and that's exactly what I was mentioning literally like, two seconds ago. Quick said, using that pulverize to make sure Gilius cannot get onto Dark Side, but it's still blowing the flash is going to be quite important. Yeah, yeah, without that flash. Darkseid will be a little bit more susceptible to these kind of ganks if Julius were to return in the next five or so minutes. I thought it was engaging me in the top lane there. As, uh, Dan it was, it was looking like it, but the wards, you know, I think Ruin, especially with his EQ combo, still up and available. Teleport into the mid lane there for Kakan. He is struggling in this mid lane. 10 CS down at this point in time. We kind of expect that lead to open up for Jazuki as this laning phase goes on, but he is nearly level six. That should give him some reprise when he gets to that point. It is a very tough early laning phase for the Kassadin, though. He does have to be super careful. Dark Seal and Ruby Crystal on his first back, and you'll see Lost Chapter picked up there for Jizuki. Yeah, it just seems like he needs that catalyst now. Yeah, he he needs that catalyst in order to just be able to sustain. You obviously get the health refund on mana expenditure, and you get mana back when you do get damaged as well. But picking up that Dark Seal isn't such a bad buy, especially as you've got the Corrupting Potion. That extra sustain is going to be extremely important for Jizuki. Playing the lane very, very well like an Oriana should against the casting. Just very aggressive with your ball placement. Place it behind the minions. So as soon as casting comes up to auto, boom, collapse on him. Dissonance. It's a lot of damage mixed with the Thunderlords as well. Level sixes have been starting to hit here. Excoundrel, Ruin, and uh, Gilius. Both being level six very, very soon. With Jizuki just picking this one up now will be kind of the pushing point for them. Kind of the turning point in uh, for them to make actual plays. It looks like Quickset's potentially caught out here. Does have his flash available. Yeah, it does flash it over the wall. Jizuki's going to be there. Shockwave's going to find him as well. Level four against two level fives and a level six. Quickset in a lot of trouble. Doesn't have unbreakable will and just ends up going down to first blood. Does go over to Gilius. And that will be a nice advantage for him. And like I said, if he pops off, he can really get himself going. Kakan now, knowing Jazuki doesn't have that ult, plus the mana is not there as well, can go a little bit more aggressive now. Yeah, he can look to consistently pressure now that that ult is down and the mana is kind of dissipated from Jazuki. But a little bit out of pitch position there for Quickset. Looks like Jilius also moving towards putting pressure down in that bot lane. There'll be a move for him to potentially play off the back of... Um, Mintry and Jack Troll in that bot lane shoving up and maybe looking to put pressure onto that first tier turret. But you have to remember that the response from JWoww and Kakan could be pretty swift. They could make their way down there pretty readily. So this will be a very hard opening to find, you have to feel, for Julius. Even if he makes the engage happen, you will find that there's an instantaneous response from JWoww. As long as he's not being over eager with his positioning, Ruin shouldn't be able to stop that from happening. They have great tower diving potential on the side of Giants. And like we mentioned before, there's quite heart back to it, is the fact that they can, uh, War can execute a 1-3-1. One, one. The problem is, 1-3-1 one, one versus a Caitlyn and a Zac, Ash just asking for a turret dive. Julius is coming in again. They have got that vision control on that river brush. Darkseid is playing super defensively here, as you would expect. And uh, Ruin was just keeping JWoww occupied, you feel, because he didn't want that to channel the Shen ultimate. And uh, Julius now looking for the tower dive. Ruin is there up against JWoww. This could be the perfect opportunity. Darkseid will see it with that ward. And they're going to be able to spot him out. Look at those trap placements, though. Darkseid just sneaking past that one. Nice pulverize onto Gilius to go and get the engagement. Jack Troll's going to jump in and leap and help him. Sun isn't going to land. Featherstorm actually comes out. Dan and Kakan are going to be here as well. Teleport's coming down from Ruin, but it's not going to matter because Jack Troll already falls down. That's going to be a three man less bounce, but it's not going to matter at all because Warwick's just going to follow this one up. Ruin's going to come through with the Cataclysm. It's not going to help him at all, though, as he just chases off Dan. Ace Noel is going to finish him off, though. Kakan is going to follow him up, though, with the last auto attack. But here comes the Caitlyn. One more attack. Auto, but no, Jazuki's going to be there with the orb just to finish up the kill. A really oddly telegraphed fight there coming out from war. And you've got to kind of put your question in your head. Was that really worth it in the end? Because what are advantages are you really going to get off this? I mean, that was a messy, messy team fight. Yes, you should have forced out the uh, teleport from Ruin. The net kill advantage did go over the Giants. But what did you really gain from it? What did you, you didn't really get the opportunity to see just that tier one turret. In fact, you actually give it the opposite and dark side and quick set have been able to shove into that bot lane. You did give a kill over to this Caitlyn. A nice input of gold for a later game of scaling any carry. You won't say no to that but it was a very messy fight. The reaction from War was swift and good, and it helped them prevent a first tier turret going down. Again, Julius, after he cleared, he actually didn't even clear that control ward. He was trying to clear that control ward. Should have cleared it and maybe tried to back out, but they uh, ended up forcing it out. 
We saw Jack Troll there just ju leap on him. Stand behind me straight on top just to try and make sure Quickseth couldn't make any more, well, any more of a proactive play like he did. Got to protect that vision, like I said. Giants have got a very, very nasty tower dive composition. And if War allow that to happen and just allow their vision to be taken away, it's going to be, uh, it's going to lead them to be very, very sad if they give up a couple of kills. I like the proactive response from War as they saw uh, Gilius line up. Usually you would try and clear waves. The one, the two, there's two tactics to dealing with a potential tower dive. You either clear waves so it makes it a bit riskier to go for a tower dive, or you just try and force an engage onto the jungler like they did there. So they actually forced Gilius to move back, and it positionally then, War were actually grouped up around their blue side entrance. So they had the group up advantage. Gilius tried to split them up, and I think the one thing that kind of saved Giants was that flank from Jizuki managed to come in and put pressure on the sidelines, split up the War team, who you know, could have very easily barreled in onto Gilius or barreled in onto the back line of Mintry, but Jizuki providing the threat from the sideline then allowed him to split up the War composition and uh, actually forced them to get some return kills here. And that lane presence, that lane shove has resulted in a lot of pressure going down onto this tier one turret in the mid lane. Oh, stretching strikes onto a minion. Oh, Shockwave is actually going to go off as well if they do look for the disengage. Very, very late rotation here from Dan and Quickseth. Look at that damage down to the turret now. That's uh, that's one minion wave to two minion waves. That's a really big problem now for War. If that goes down, that's going to open the map up to Julius. Just enable him to make even more plays. Absolutely. And also, you've got to mention the fact that this is the result of the laning phase that Suzuki has with the blue buff. It's even harder for this. Yeah, that's the, that was a, a fantastic. Actually, doesn't pull Alistair through the wall. That's that's a hard laning phase for Kastin when the Oriana has the blue buff. She is going to shove you in continuously. You don't have the wave clear to contend. And this should now be an easy turret. Yeah, it's pretty much free. And that's the problem when you don't have priority in this mid lane. Aurea was, or Oriana was, the pickup here for Giants into this Kassadin. So they know what they can do. They yeah. know the pressure that Oriana creates, and that's exactly what's happened. And you saw Kakan had to make a play down the bottom side in that earlier engagement with Dan to try and pick up something. Jack Troll, double daggers isn't going to go through that shield. Unbreakable. Yeah, and then Braum's just so good against Zaya in that regard. You just kind of block all of those feathers going through, stopping from getting any roots down. Something else that I want to pick up on, and it's something that I just want to touch on based on that mid lane laning phase. People will often say, oh, well, you didn't have that bad of a laning phase. Oriana didn't get a kill. She only got a 10 CS advantage. But it, that's not what you need to take, keep your eye on. The amount of pressure that Oriana generated in the mid lane, the, the, the amount of pressure they put onto the mid lane tier one to take as the first parrot of the game spells volumes about how dominant Jazuki has been in terms of wave control. This could be a tough situation for War, though. Look at this go. Kakan just walked straight past Gilius. Gilius is just going to come in a little bit too late. Dan Smite sit away. Let's bounce is available. Gilius does find two with the stretching strikes. He finds Quick Set. He's going to draw him in, but Stan United is going to come down. And now they're directly where they want to be. Dan onto the wall. Couldn't find them. But J is going to be there with the taunts. Gilius, he's going to go into blob form. He's probably going to go down. In fact, Giants actually don't want to give this up without a fight. Teleport from Ruin is going to force them to actually back off here. So Gilius not actually giving up his life whatsoever. Jazuki off to the side wave does have Shockwave available. They spot the orb now. They can imagine there's probably a ward there. Jazuki knows that. They spot it out with the control. War, if you're this point, I think you just back give off up, here. Jazuki is just so, so deadly with that orb. Being this far ahead as well with one item and with the Sork Shoes, it's going to be very dangerous. There comes the Shockwave. It's only going to land on one. That's going to double pull right into another one. Ruin just ruins War as they just meld them. Jazuki ends up picking up two kills with the Caitlyn picking up another one. Giants with the perfect map play and War just overstaying, being a little bit too greedy. And they lose yet another turret. I don't know what War felt that they could do to defend that tier one turret when Dan was separated from the team. You're one of your main damage sources where it's about a third HP. That was a that was a tower you just had to give up. Okay, yes, you lose another portion of map presence, but now you've lost the turret and you've given away kills as well. That was an unnecessary risk. War had no way of contending under that turret. Even if they pulled off the perfect team fight, even though Shockwave only hit one member, it was such a hard defense to try and make, and they, they just made the wrong decision outright there. And I've got, to, I've got to take it back. Giants have looked very good thus far. I, I talked about Giants potentially not being the strength of roster that we were expecting. They have looked very good thus far in this game. And uh, Wind and Rain, not quite the strength of their previous iteration without Dan Dan and the rest of the, uh, the lineup formulating the top side of that map. It would have been funny, actually, if Dan Dan did play on the wall roster, because then we'd have Dan Dan and Dan. Dan, yeah. Dan Dan and Dan. And that wouldn't have got confusing. Definitely not. Definitely not. And now War. 
They need to pay their, to their wing condition. That wing condition probably does uh, result in them going into 1v1. But the thing is, with Giants, like I mentioned before, it's going to be very easy for them to turret dive. That's exactly what they're setting up for again. Yeah, you want to go into a 1v1 as the walk up position, but there's no way that you can do it because you isolate yourself in a 1 3 1. You make it very easy for Julius to roam across the map. Now that they've opened up the map with their mid lane and bot lane turret, Julius can make moves to form tower dives, to form skirmishes, continue to lay on the pressure for the Giants roster here. And Kakan is still stuck in the side lane. At this point in the game where turrets have gone down, Kakan wants to be finding himself farming in a side lane looking for a 1v1 where he's kind of undisturbed. And Dan is having to hang around here to try and prevent a tower dive, but they can't defend against this Caitlyn Braum siege that is so strong. Those traps getting set up now. It's such a difficult defense to have to make for war. Well, this is the problem with war's composition, or let's uh, look at the jungler side of that composition, is the fact that what does Dan do in these team fights? What does he do? What does he assassinate? Who does he assassinate? You can't assassinate the Caitlyn, because yeah. you've got Jack Troll, you've got Gilius and Ruin to kind of sit there on top of her. You've got the shield from Jujuki as well, as well as the zone control. Well, Gragas wasn't banned this game. I much would have preferred a Gragas instead of a, a Kha'Zix. I don't know whether Kha'Zix was there to try and find early jewels versus Julius and try and shut down the Zac before he could start to make his presence felt across the map, but Dan Dan certainly, sorry, Dan certainly hasn't, you've got me saying Dan Dan now. Dan certainly <laughs> hasn't found that opportunity just yet. And I'm, again, I'm not sure what he does in these team fights. I don't know whether he is supposed to be a distraction or a, an ability to jump in. You know, we talked about um, Kassadin working well as a unit when they jump in to threaten an AD carry. There might be a situation when we're talking about Kakan and Dan jumping to threaten Caitlyn in later game team fights, and the both of them should be able to deal with her. But I'm still very worried about, you know, until you get to that point, until you get to a point you're ready to team fight and make those kind of plays, what does Dan Dan do? How, what does he bring to the team in terms of defensive turrets? What does he bring to the team in terms of disengage? Not a lot. When you play a Kazakhs from behind, it feels very, very hard to have an impact. And that's exactly what, well, the little of he's having right now, an impact. Would Jizuki be able to impact this turret? Quipta taking a lot of damage, obviously not very tanky at this point. Prioritize the mobility boost, they're gonna give up another turret. It's the third one down now. Giants just rotating across the map, playing their composition to a T, playing their win condition. Down also to get hit by the stretch and strikes there. And Kakan, he is pushing this mid wave in, but Jizuki can roam without too much yeah. of an issue. Clear waves, roam top, take turret, roam mid, catch the wave. The way you punish a roam is by having the ability to shove into the into the tower very, very quickly. As a custom, you're not going to be able to do that as effectively, especially when you're only charging your um, E by yourself. So you know, you're not going to have the ability to push into turret consistently and punish the Orianna for these roams. And also look at the Giant's composition. That is built to siege. That is a siege composition to a T. Caitlyn sets up with the traps. You have the Orianna ball to zone and give you time to get basic attacks onto the turret, and then there's the threat of the tower dive from the Zac and the Jarvan. Every time they move up to a turret, War are going to be thinking, we don't want to get dived by Zac. How can we defend this? We don't have the wave clear necessary, and that's another thing that we haven't picked up on, really. The wave clear just isn't there for War. They have nothing to defend these towers. So when a, a minion wave pushes up for Giants, they're going to get the entirety of that minion wave to be able to siege onto the turret, get those basic attacks down and look to take it out. There is no consistent and reliable wave clear from war. Even Kakan has to kind of commit himself as a body to clear these waves, and that's just not what you want as a casted. Not at all. I mean, Darkseid's got it there in the range form, but the problem is you're underneath the turret, and that's the massive issue. There's Giants now just looking for this dragon. Is up in about nine seconds. And you can see prioritization of the lanes as well, getting lane priority in the bottom side now. Not too much of an issue for them. Ruins is up towards the top side with Dan. They know where he is at this current moment in time. Yeah. They can easily rotate to this mountain dragon without too much of a problem. We spoke about the vision control last game in the last few series from these teams that have been around a long time, that have a lot of experience pushing this vision line up. And that's exactly what Giants are doing. Vision from Giants has been sublime this game. They have controlled the entire neutral space of the river. I mean, impossible for war to move out. And what's interesting about taking early turrets like mid lane turret and bot lane tier one is that you actually force defensive vision lines from the team that has those turrets go down very early on, which naturally squeezes their control of these neutral vision areas very rapidly. So, you know, just because that mid lane turret, tier one turret went down, because of the threat of the Giants roster making catches and finding picks in the enemy jungle, you naturally force war into a position where they can't actually move to contest neutral objectives because there is just too much threat of a, a, a giant's engage and not enough disengage from the war roster.
if they had the good disengage of a Gragas, for instance, they probably wouldn't be too bothered, because if the Zack jumps in, you just throw down your ultimate and knocks them away, but they don't have that on their roster. I mean, Quickseth has done a, a, a good job thus far oh, yeah, of actually totally. pulverizing out of the Elastic Slingshot. The problem is, like we mentioned before, does he use that for the engage or does he do that for the disengage? Which is kind of a, a no-brainer at this point. Use it for the disengage and just make sure that Gilius can't get on the back line. You can see now JWoww up in that top side is just consistently pushing. He is ruining Ruin in this top side in terms of actual pressure in the lane. But the problem is Ruin doesn't really mind too much. Realistically, JWoww's not going to say that. Sorry, quickly. Yeah, no. He's only got the Ravenous Hydra. The Titanic Hydra, sorry. I, I mean, that's his only form of damage source. You make a really good point, because he's, he's basically gone Titanic Hydra first, have that ability to push in the side lane to try and get uh, trades in his favor against Ruin on this J4. But J4, you know, he's going to be sitting there. Ruin's going to be sitting there. Not going to be bothered about a Shen pushing in. He's never going to lose his turret rapidly to a Shen. And he can clear waves for days. And he's got a tier mat now. He's got Dragon Strike. He's going to be able to clear against this Shen. And realistically, you know, a Shen with just a Titanic, Titanic Hydra is not going to be a huge force to contend with in a team fight because you'll very easily and readily be able to burn him down. Ruin is perfectly happy with this situation. And that he is. Now that top side is pushing in. Giants playing this slow, methodical game. They don't want to fight because they don't need to. Because if they if they fight, realistically, they're probably going to win it. Uh, just going on the amount of CC and the amount of uh, damage that this Kanan is going to output. The problem is that they're kind of, well, not the problem, but the problem for war is they kind of have to be the initiators at this point because you cannot sit back and wait for a tower diving composition to uh, do anything. In fact, Gillies has been caught, but jumped straight in. There's a lot of mobility on the war side, and really, I think that's the only thing going for them at this current moment in time. Yeah, it's very difficult to lock down a lot of members of the war composition. I think that's, again, something you picked up on nicely there. I would think we wait for this Lich Bane to get finished for Kakan. I think maybe Dan picks up another damage item, maybe the Black Cleaver that he could be working towards. And if they can then find position to take out Mintry, or Minitri, then that is potentially the way that they can win these team fights. Take the Caitlyn out, you limit some of the damage source. You still have to contend with the Orianna, but again, not at that same kind of level of consistent damage output that the Caitlyn is. That could be a way in here for the war roster is Dan has to flash. Yeah, Dan has to flash. Takes a lot of damage from the ace in the hole as well. Except what's there, but again, can't really do much as Nalister. You you are on you're an all or nothing champion. You go in, you get a headbutt pulverize, fantastic, or you can pulverize to disengage. It's just not happening for you. Alistair has two modes: peel or engage. There is nothing in between. You're not a support that can make plays from range. You're not a support that can try and make picks like Braum can by not really committing too much, just throwing a winter's bite out here and there. Alistair has to commit as a whole and commit the team fight to make an engage happen, or he has to defend, which he has been doing for a long time. I mean, Giants looking for their resurgence, right? Yeah. They're looking for this a long-standing organization, looking to just prove to everybody that they are the team everybody kind of remembers. I wouldn't say more of a macro team, but right now, they're doing the macro game absolutely perfectly. And a lot of teams that I've seen, especially in kind of if you look back at CSQ, executing their composition was sometimes quite hard to do. And they're doing it absolutely perfectly, not needing to fight. They can just sit back, they can wait, they can take these neutral objectives. Dragon's up again in another one minute and 50. And yes, War have um, at least taken one of those off them. But the problem is they have to commit so much to a single fight that Giants can really just kind of take it all in their stride at this point in the game. And even if you commit as War, you still have to get through the Orianna Shockwave. And remember, you are not committing in a, in a way that is going to be super effective. You know, like, uh, for instance, a J4, you can jump in and then sort of get out if he wants to. You can find a Cataclysm to separate things. There's always the back out of the bounce from Julius. If you commit as a team, as War, you have no way of going back on that commitment. So if you commit, you engage, there is no way of getting out of that engage, which is huge, because that just means it's very easy for Shizuki to find a Shockwave onto the key members of War. Kakan taking a lot of damage there from the Caitlyn now, who is at almost three items going towards what we imagine to be a rapid fire cannon. This has become the staple 7 11 Caitlyn build, by the way. Replacing that, uh, replacing the Runan's Hurricane with a static shiv because you no longer get the headshot generation stacks on that Runan's Hurricane. It's just such a pain right now, but Kakan. Oh, Ruin. Almost took a Shadow Dash, but he's going to be able to back off. Now, Kakan, like we mentioned before, it's got nice wave clear. The problem is he has to step up and commit his whole body to it. This is what Giants have been doing. This is what they do best. Sit underneath these turrets. Traps, ball, siege, go. 
and there's nothing that War can do. You can see here they are absolutely limp. There's nothing they can do to commit to this fight. Here we go. Can oh, actually get caught can out. Actually, might be caught out here, but Shen is going to come through and he gets one taunt. And now the Kale is free to do damage. Jay Wild amongst three people. Jack Troll managed to get up on the sidelines there. You can see Ruin just taking on two members all by himself, by the rest of his team. Just take out Jay Wow. Ruin's still on the defensive here. And Gilius finds another kill. They trade two for one. They take the top turret as well. Giants are more than happy with that trade. It was almost. A great engage from War, almost, because Kakan jukes back in, used the Shen to buy him some time and look for the uh, flash engage onto Mintry. If Min Minutes had been engaged on, he had flashed out of that Shen talk. That could have been a way for War to find their way back into that fight with absolutely fantastic flash from Minutes. Got himself out of the firing line, put himself in a position where he was no longer threatened because Kakan had used his engage. And Dan wasn't there following up as well. If Dan had managed to go in, with the, the, uh, the Kakan on the cast in. That might have been a way to put pressure onto Minute, but right there, perfectly defensive execution of a fight by Giants. It's the Shen delivery system that they need to be able to lock down, but they just couldn't find it. Baron will go over to Giants, as well as that Infernal going over to War, so they trade those objectives. Mountain Drake is going to be the next Dragon available. But the thing is, with Giants right now, more than happy again with that trade, and they're just going to be able to push forward onto these turrets, doing what they do time and time again. They trade two for one, not too much of an issue. That flash actually for some dark side there. Stretching side does land, Queen Seth gets a nice two-man pulverize. Now Giants just forcing these turrets down one by one by one. How do you punish this Giants roster from moving up to a turret like this and just basically standing there basic attacking it without any way to respond in a safe setting for war? The only way you can do it is by making those kind of plays. The only way you can do it is by having Kastin jump in there with Dan, having Shen be a backup and try and put pressure onto the Caitlyn, because you can see here there's nothing that War can do. No way to effectively clear waves, and they are too far behind to feel like they can actually force a team fight. JWoww seems to be the only one that can actually duel his lane opponent at this current time. But he doesn't need to be at what he can't do that necessarily. He can't be able to he can't find the solo kill because Ruin can just flag and drag away and JY hasn't really got any meaningful follow-up apart from using that shadow dash. Look at those two Oh man, perfectly symmetrical with the ball in the middle. With the four traps either side. Now this is it. Once more giants going for this turret siege. A lot of wave here on the side of Dark Side. Nice oh, shot wave actually. Whoa! Oh the damage! Jizuki one-shotting Dark Side pretty much. Shockwave into the dissonance, no worries. Shocks out of one off, no problem. Death cap the inhibitor, let's go. Giants, they're looking ginormous in this game. And Wyndham Rain is getting swept away. And with that Baron buff as well, even easier for them to find these sieges. My way, I mean, you can miss it. That, that right there epitomized this entire game in a nutshell. War very cautiously approaching their own turret. And even then getting punished for it. Jazuki with a massive play onto Dark Side there. Huge, huge catch onto Zaya. He's gonna give Giants two inhibitors here. I don't even know if War can even respond. Two inhibitors for nothing as well. Absolutely nothing was traded forwards. Just no hope right now, it seems for War. I mean Giants, it's only a matter of time now, because all they need to do is hey, focus that top wave. Let's go five man top. Let's stick Ruin in the bottom side. His teleport's gonna be up the time we manage to push the wave. There's not much they can do. You've got to kind of think to yourself now, Scoundrel. You know, War, they've got to kind of think to game number two. Yeah. I, I like the idea of trying to split push against this composition that wants to fight. There's kind of like a trifecta of how you approach different styles of compositions. A good way to battle a team fighting composition is ensure that you gain map advantage from never having the team fight. So that's why you might go for a 1 3 1, because you mean in the side lanes, you'll force this team height, fight heavy, this five man siege heavy composition. Oh, shockwave prediction, but no, Kakan just jumps straight into him. Stan United with Jesus as well, but Jazuki just melts him where he stands. He leads in amongst three people of war now, but Shield is going to be there from Jack Troll, that unbreakable. Is going to be able to keep him nice and safe. A nice pick up onto Kakan now. And now Giants looking for this win. Pushing onto this second, no, this last inhibitor turret. Going in here, that's a kill over. Giants Rune going in. They're going to push onto this final inhibitor here, Jaws. Yeah. Yes, I mean, well, they're not going to decide to do it at all. I mean, War are just trying to kite as much as they can. 
Third inhibitor is going to go down. Giants now pushing for this now. Five members. Gilius did go into his passive form a second ago. He did get taken down to minuscule blob four, but it's not going to matter whatsoever. Giants looking to get this first win on the board. Darkside just gets soloed out. Jack tries. Jack Trolls just secures his own kill. One Nexus turret goes down. The second one soon to fall. And this tower sees tower dive composition from Giants has worked out all too perfectly. Beautiful cataclysm to finish off the game. Make that three kills. Four man knockoff from Quickset. Kind of deserved that one. But Giants will find themselves a double and will find themselves the first game.